your dear friend who I'm having talks with Jesus about saying she's not actually ever allowed to leave the island. Her name is Danielle Porter and she is going to share with us this evening. So would you just all please give her a round of applause, just make it feel more than welcome. big bottle of water. So I'm lucky I don't have my hydro jug, which usually is like attached to me. So, okay. Welcome. Hi. Good evening. I am Danielle Porter, like Sharon said. Um, and I am so honored and blessed to be a, to have been asked to speak tonight. And so before we get started, I want to open with a quick little prayer. So if you bow your heads. Father, thank you for these women. Thank you for North Shore Christian Fellowship. I am grateful for all the ways our church and these women impact your kingdom on a daily basis. I pray as we come together tonight that you are glorified in all that we say and do. I pray specifically for what I have to say tonight, that it be communicated clearly. And like our Pastor Fulton says, that if anything I say resonates or touches someone, Lord, let it be assigned to you. And that if anything I say is crazy or doesn't make sense, just let that be assigned to me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay. So, when Karen first approached me to speak, and we were discussing the theme and all of the wonderful table names, like Sharon said, um, we talked about unwrapping the names of Jesus. And immediately, my mind lit up with all the names of Jesus and all of the ways that his character has been shown to me throughout my life. Um, but... <laughs> If you know me, you know that I am not really good with authority, and I don't really like rules. So when you heard all of the table names, you might have thought, huh, El Shaddai. I don't really remember Jesus being called that. That's because it's the name of God, too. And so I, when I pictured this, I pictured this huge, massive Christmas tree, like a good solid 12-footer. And every name of God or Jesus is in a box, like wrapped up underneath the tree. And so some scholars say that, looking through the Bible, that there are at least a hundred, if not at most a thousand names. And I thought, if every single one of those presents under the tree is something that, or a name of God, I don't want to just unwrap the ones of Jesus. I'm kind of greedy, and gifts are my love language, and I want to unwrap them all. So we're going to do that, and we're not going to unwrap all the thousand, because then I would definitely blow my 20-minute time limit, but we're going to pick out a couple of them that I feel like I've had a personal connection through without my life, and I hope that those resonate with you as well. I know each of us has our own testimony and has our own story of the ways God has shown his character to us throughout our lives, um, and so let's get started. Uh, before we start unwrapping, though, we kind of need to figure out why God has more than one name. Because isn't his name Yehovah? Isn't it Yahweh? In Jewish culture, they don't even speak his name or write it because they don't want to uh, break the third commandment. So even now, devout Jews will not speak or write anything that could be misconstrued as the Lord's name or as God. And so, but we, as New Testament believers... Um, we kind of follow Romans 10, 13, which quotes the prophet Joel saying, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And in Psalm 104, it says to enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. So we have to have some sort of vocabulary to praise. Plus, it's only natural that we start to start trying to verbalize what we feel in our hearts. God created our brains to make sense of this world, to categorize, to name, to explain, and to create order. And so we were given an innate desire to know God, and trying to label him or give him names, it's not wrong. We're just trying to express what's in our heart. And so giving him names is just one attempt that we have to do that. So the first gift I want to unwrap with you is Elohim which commonly people assign as the creator. The fir it was first given in Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, Elohim created the heaven and the earth. Elohim literally translated means unlimited power to keep 
a promise. Isn't it incredible that the creator of all of this has unlimited power to keep a promise? And then in the New Testament, Paul, writing to the church of Colossae, wrote, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, the things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And I think it's easy when we live in 2022 and there are literal people who are paid by massive corporations to create new things that we can buy every single day. And so I think it's easy for us to shove aside the fact that God created all of this. And not only did he create the heaven and the earth, but he created you. And he creates new life. And he continues to create new life, not just in the physical sense, but also in our spiritual sense. He can create in you a new heart that craves new things in an instant. Another less called upon name that I've come to know on an intimate level is El Olam. Abraham gave God this name, the everlasting God, after God had promised Abraham a nation of children, and he took it into his own hands to start that family. El Olam is the everlasting God, the God who keeps his promises. He has no beginning and no end. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He is the same here in Hawaii. He is the same in Virginia with my parents. He is the same in Korea with my husband. And in a world that shifts and changes on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, I can cry out to El Olam and know that deep in my soul, he keeps his promises. I take comfort in that. As a military spouse, I end up moving a lot. And there's always this big fear that's attached to it that, you know, what if I'm not going to find my people? What if it takes too long to find a church? But I have to remain in El Olam. But he's the same here. He's the same there. He cared for me there where we were before. And he'll care for me here. And he'll care for me wherever we end up after this. One of my favorite names for God is Jehovah Rapha. In Exodus, Moses and his friends were wandering in the desert, and they came upon water that was bitter, Mara. There, God issued them instruction and said that if they followed his instruction, he promised to be the God who heals them. He spent, or Jehovah Rapha. We know Jesus as Jehovah Rapha, too. He spent much of his earthly ministry healing people, and likely you've needed healing and cried out to Jehovah Rapha. Whether it be a healing from a physical illness, a healing of your soul, your mind, your land, relationships. I've met people with incredible healing stories. There are probably people in this room that have stories either of their own or people that are very deeply connected to them of cancer that just overnight went away. Or people who were on the brink of death that came back to life literally and went on to have an incredible testimony of God's faithfulness. That's Jehovah Rapha. He is the God that heals. He promises it. Another name that we use a lot is Jehovah Jireh. And if you go to North Shore Christian Fellowship, you know Tyler sings that song a lot. Um, he is God the provider. And when I dwell on that, the first few things that pop into my head are how many times God has provided in my time of need. Whether that be financially, we can't cover the bills and a check miraculously comes in the mail. Or physical things, you know, our car's getting ready to break down and a friend is selling a car and he provided in that way. But originally, the name was given to God because he provided Abraham's sacrifice in Genesis 22:14. 14. And fun fact, that's actually the only place in scripture that God is called Jehovah Jireh. Um, he provided manna in the desert for the Israelites. And then again, God showed himself as Jehovah Jireh in John 3:16 where he made Jesus the sacrificial lamb. He provided his only son to be the sacrifice for our sin. He is provider. He is our ultimate provider. Not just of the things we want, but of the things we truly need, salvation. A name that I've come to truly know is that of God as Elroy, the God who sees. Hagar gave God this name, pregnant and alone in the desert. And thankfully, I've not been in a love triangle like that. But what I have been is alone in my house, washing dishes at the sink. Children bickering, chaos swirling behind me. My husband off in another country. 
my phone buzzing with another text asking me to do another thing. Tears streaming down my face, crying out to God and how desperately alone I feel. But he is El Roy. He is the God who sees. The God who sees all of me. My faults, my failures, the ways I don't measure up as a wife or a mother or any other name that I've ever assigned myself. But he sees me. He really sees me. He sees the me that other people don't get to see. Um, he's El Roy. I think of Jesus as the good shepherd. In John 10, 10, Jesus tells us that he is the good shepherd. And I started thinking about the good shepherd and I don't have anything to shepherd in my life other than my two kids. I don't have sheep, I don't have goats, I don't live on a farm. Um, so it's kind of hard to place myself in the good shepherd story. <laughs> So I started talking about all the ways that have gone astray, just like a wayward sheep. And we call that girl 2002 Danielle, or 2007 Danielle, or sometimes we call my daughter 2004 Danielle, because if you ever want to know what I was like in college, just watch my daughter. Um, she is astray. Uh, but like a sheep knows the voice of their shepherd, I know the voice of my shepherd. And I was graciously herded back to where I belong, where I'm protected, where I'm comforted, where I am guided by the Good Shepherd. As I've gotten older and experienced more of life, there have been names that have been a struggle for me to truly understand, but none more than Abba Father. I didn't have a good relationship with my father growing up. Um, wasn't really a great man. Um, and so when I was taught that Abba meant daddy or dad or father, I was like, nah, I'm good. I don't need a God like that. I have, I have lots of other ways, other characteristics of God that I can get behind, but not Abba Father. Really, really struggled with that. Um, but really, once I started understanding what Abba Father really meant, I can totally get behind that. Because Abba Father isn't Daddy. I mean, yes, it is Dad. But it's an intimacy level. That's what Abba Father means. It's an intimacy and a trust with your Father. It's also obedience and respect. And that, especially when I became a mother, I began to see shreds of understanding in that. Because I want my children to feel like they can run to me for protection and comfort. I want them to feel that way about their own father. But I also want their obedience and their respect. And as a parent, you get that. You get the complexity of how Abba Father can both desperately love their children and sacrifice for them in ways that you would never sacrifice for anyone else, that you would give your life for your children, but also desire their respect and their obedience. And lastly, I want to draw our attention to Jesus as Messiah, Son of the living God. In Matthew 16, Jesus asked Simon Peter, who do you say I am? Jesus, or Peter could have answered in any number of ways. But what he said cuts me to my core because I have been asked before, who is Jesus? Who is he to you? And I have to come up with an answer for that. Peter replied, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus was promised by God from the very beginning of Genesis, Jesus was there. God knew already that he was going to have to provide a savior, a liberator to set us free. And that's what he did with Jesus. He is our sacrificial lamb. Going back to the prophet Joel who said, Anyone, or everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. When Peter said that Jesus is Messiah, it's not a casual thing. That was a commitment to Jesus that he will serve him, that he is his liberator. And so as I think of all the names, I think the temptation for me is to start using the names like magic spells. Like Harry Potter, if you just say the name the right way and you wave the wand in just the right way with the right flick of the wrist, Jehovah Jireh is going to show up. But that is not how this works. I wish it was. I wish there was an easy button for all the things, but that is not how this works. You have to experience the name to really know it. And I don't know about you, but I want the abundant life that I was promised in John 10.10. 10. I want to open every single gift under the tree. And unlike my children, who sometimes open it, look at it, put it aside, and open the next one, I don't want to do that. I want to open the gift. I want to experience it. 
I want to put it in my house. I want to talk to my friends about it. I want to know that gift. And so if that means that I have to lack something in order to truly experience God as provider, then take it away, Lord. If I have to be truly alone to know El Roy, then let it be. And if I have to be healed from some pain to fully understand Jehovah Rapha in my life, then I'm here, I'm here for the healing too. Because if there is one thing that I am fully confident of, it is that the gift is worth it. The process is worth the promise. We were never promised an easy life as Christians, a life filled with comfort and ease where we can push an easy button and Jehovah Rapha shows up. What we were promised is a savior. We were promised a God who sees us. We were promised Emmanuel, God with us. So I'd love to close this in prayer. If you'll bow your heads. El Shaddai, you are God Almighty. And as scary as it is to pray big, scary prayers, the kind that submit to sanctification, I pray tonight that the women in this room are bold enough to pray for a real experience with you. Not a secondhand, someone else's testimony version, but a true encounter with you, our living God. I thank you that you know every single woman in this room's needs, that you know exactly how to reach their heart, I pray that we're receptive and open to whatever you have for us, that we will never be satisfied with just opening the gift, but that we will always choose to joyfully experience the process as we anticipate the promise. Lord, we pray expectantly that you will show us new aspects of your character as we submit our lives to you. And God, if there is any woman in this room that does not know you as her personal Lord and Savior, I pray that she encounter you tonight that she willingly submits to your loving authority and gives her life to you. It is in your mighty and holy name, Jesus. Amen.